Welcome to the Be Effective Podcast. Before this episode starts, let's give a shout out to EFT. The mission at EFT is to create effective police officers by optimizing performance, education, science driven fitness, and combatives. Developed for those who want the most comprehensive fitness plan available. Created by a team of physical therapists, strength and conditioning coaches, nutrition specialists, and a team of active and former law enforcement with over 70 years combined experience. Use promo code PODCAST at checkout for 10% off the life of your membership. Episode 40, Mr. Matt Donahue. Matt has been in law enforcement since 2012, where he has experienced as a patrolman, taser instructor, FTO, crisis negotiation team member for SWAT, and a part-time detective. He is also an active EFT member. Before becoming a police officer, he was a part of the Massachusetts National Guard as an infantryman and served in Afghanistan as a machine gunner. In June of last year, Matt was shot and seriously injured in the line of duty. In this episode, we talk about his story, what happened, and his road to recovery. Matt reached out to us on EFT shortly after his incident regarding alternative programming due to his injury he had sustained. We are absolutely honored to have this warrior on our team. I want to thank him for sharing his story and his ability to look objectively at his incident. With that said, without further ado, episode 40 with Mr. Matt Donahue. Enjoy. I've been thinking about you, no homo, but uh, you know, like ever since that first email you sent us, uh, you know, us reaching out, we've talked offline and stuff like that, man. It's just super incredible. Um, anytime there's a critical incident and the good guys win, it's always, it's, it's always incredible. It's always good to hear. Um, and again, thank you for coming on. Um, a lot of people probably don't know who you are. They probably remember the incident, but probably don't know who you are. Yeah. If you could maybe give the listeners a quick background of who is Matt. All right. Uh, Matt Donahue, um, patrolman with Braintree Police Department in Massachusetts. Uh, been been in law enforcement for about almost 10 years now. And, uh, you know, before that, I was in the Massachusetts Army National Guard out in Afghanistan and started the application process to become a police officer and uh, came home from Afghanistan and just started right in it, right in the thick of it, going through the process and got hired and been doing that ever since. Do you always want to be a cop? Yeah, I did. I did. I was, uh, you know, before my unit deployed, I was going to school for criminal justice. Um, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do as far as if I really want to be a cop until I started taking courses, general ed. And then I took some law enforcement courses and I was like, you know, what, this is, this is what I want to do. Um, so I just kind of, then that's when I joined the Mass Army National Guard and, you know, uh, wanted to, you know, serve my country and deploy. And then it also helps in Massachusetts. That kind of gives you a bump as far as the hiring process. So it was like a, it was like a two for one sort of deal for me. With that. Right. Did you have any other family members that served? Um, my grandfather, uh, my, both my grandfathers uh, served one in the Coast Guard, one in, one was a com- army combat engineer, both in like World War II. Um, but as far as that goes, that's, uh, you know, my brothers, uh, one of my brothers wanted to serve, but never got the opportunity to because he just didn't pass medical just because of like our childhood arthritis. So he was kind of bummed about that, but it was just going to be him and I that were going to go in and, uh, you know, I made it, you know, through. My granddad served, uh, he served in the army, but then he also was a cop in Connecticut for a while. So I have the granddad sense of service there as well. So are you still currently in the guard? No, I did, um, I won't say nine or 10 years. Uh, once, once I did become a police officer and after the deployment, I mean, you know, everyone knows shift work is brutal. You know, we work four on two off. And, uh, so drill weekend would either fall on a weekend that I was working and it's like, okay, whatever. But then when it would fall on like one of my weekends off that I get every six weeks and now I'm doing that. And I mean, not to sound like selfish or anything like that, but I was kind of like, I was like, all right, I kind of need to, I need to pick one and, you know, I need to focus in and hone in on everything, and focus on my career, the new career. And, uh, you know, ended up just not re-upping. Um, so I did, yeah, I did nine years because I did six, six year contract and then I re-enlisted for three more years. So I don't think that's being selfish, bro. I think that's just life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can only spread yourself so thin and if you want to get, and if you want to get good at something or if you want to, you know, advance in one area, you have to obviously focus on that one area. So you went to the Academy, got the Academy, 
what was your first what was your first year like as a cop? It was it was it was interesting. Just kind of, I, I mean, I was ten years ago, so I was you know I was in my early mid twenties, um, and I'm going to calls and like, dealing with dealing with people having all these life episodes like that are way older than me that experience way more, and here I am trying to be like this you know, this voice of reason and <laughs> tell, tell somebody that's like 55 years old, like a 24 year old telling somebody that's like 55 year old, it's having issues with their wife or whatever, just like having a bad day and everything going on. And I'm trying to be this voice of reason. So that was kind of like, that was a trip just being like, oh. yeah, you can't really say, yeah, man, I totally understand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cause you I don't, just, I do just try to be like, all right, what's the logic? And like, let's just follow the stream of logic and go there instead of like, yeah. And I think that's important, man. I think that logic and common sense, even if you don't have that life experience, can definitely play a role in how you interact with someone, right? You know, kind of what I found um, when I was when I was a training sergeant was I found out that it was the younger the kids were, and I guess as technology grew, they became less likely to be able to communicate effectively with um, people who they can't relate to people who can't talk through text message or emojis, right? They have that issue of, of communication. I think that's, I mean, communication is a, is, is a massive, massive de-escalation tool, right? So being able to have that ability is super, uh, super important, um, super critical to the job. So your first year, um, did you get on any special teams or did you go to any type of unit uh, or, or did you just stay patrol? Uh, first year at State Patrol, so the department I started at, um, they're a smaller town, so the way they would do it was uh, I actually started there, and they put me through a part-time academy, like, so it was almost like night school without, like, the drill and ceremony and all the, you know, like, rigid stuff, and then I went through an FTO program with them, um, and then I worked part-time. I was, like, I was just, I was, like, the garbage disposal. I, I just ate all the scraps that was available. I was given a few shifts, and then I did that. Um, you know, as far as details or extra shifts and stuff. So the first year I didn't really have that opportunity with, and then within that year, the way they do it is they'd hire you off of the test list. And then when they had an opening, they had like a pool of part-time people and they're like, all right, we have a full-time opening. We're going to give it to you. And, uh, I got one within, within a year. And then they sent me to a full-time academy, uh, which was good. And then I kind of, then once I got off out of that full-time academy, I started getting into some like some of the specialty stuff and uh, you know, get my feet wet a little bit more outside of the patrol aspect. Yeah, that's good, man. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, obviously patrol is the, is the, is the workhorse of the agency, right? I mean, everybody wants to be on SWAT team, but uh, you know, patrol is, is, is really where the work gets done. I'm not saying no disrespect to all the specialized units. You guys are you guys are just as important, but the guys on patrol are the ones that respond to calls for service and getting the work done. So, um, you know, kind of as your career progressed, uh, you kind of moved up in experience in job titles. Um, how did your how did your training change from kind of when you first got started and maybe as it developed? You know, year three, year five, and then currently to where you are now um yeah so year three um you know as it progressed um when i was like i said i was able to get into more stuff um i started i got into being a field training officer which was good um you know it was good to kind of i like training people and a lot of people are coming in that were like similar to me like veterans this and that and like people that they're coming from they just had this expectation of what policing was going to be like in the academy and then it was like okay this is this is the direction we're going to go and it gave me a good experience as far as that communication goes just being able to talk to somebody and teach them you know the right way or a good way to do it not really the right way there's many right ways um and then that that helped me you know on top of that then that moved me into um i applied to a read to a crisis negotiation team that was part of a regional SWAT team and uh, everyone was like, "What, well, dude? You were you were in the army? You were in the infantry? You deployed as as an infantry guy?" And I was like, "Yeah." They're like, so why don't you want to do SWAT? And I was like, "Cause I've done that stuff. Like I've, i you know, I've done the door kicking and all that stuff. And like I wanted to, I wanted to branch out and kind of like see what else was out there. And 
it actually was going to one of the crisis, having the crisis negotiation team. They did a, like a four hour block of training in the full time academy. And I went there and like, that was, that was, that really stuck out to me. Like, well, I'd really like to do that. Um, so I was able to do that. That was on like a part time basis, you know, respond to call outs, glued to your phone, you know, training every month. Um, and then in the department, I was able to like kind of work part time in assisting detectives because I wasn't like, they didn't have openings in detectives, but they're doing like surveillance or whatever. They'd grab a few people that were on the unit and be like, Hey, you want some overtime? We're going to go, we're going to go watch this house. We think there's like drug deals going on or we're going to do this, or, you know, um, kind of like interdiction type of stuff. Uh, so that was pretty cool to get, get that experience and see, you know, kind of see, see over the wall and how the detectives kind of work in that aspect. So it was just, it was, it was good getting, getting well-rounded with that. Um, and I mean, I was also, like I said, I was in a small, small department. So I was kind of, I was kind of trying to find something to keep me busy because it was just, um, I mean, there, there wasn't a lot of calls for service. There wasn't a lot of stuff going on and you'd be hunting, you'd, you'd be looking for stuff on stops and like trying to find things and it just wasn't consistent. So I was always trying to just like keep myself busy. So I, I was always branching out at that department. Yeah. And working for those small agencies is good because you can kind of do that. You can get pulled with different units because they need help. They need manpower. Um, so getting that experience is good. Now you work for two agencies, correct? So this was, so you're talking about your first agency, correct? Yeah. And then you, okay. The first agency I worked with. okay. So then, you know, obviously you, you transitioned to a different agency to, a, to the one that you're currently with now. How many years in did you do that? Was your transfer? So I transferred um, five years in. So I was five years at my former agency. Was there a reason for your transfer or was it just, just something you wanted to change? Um, the reason was I just kind of, I wanted a bigger department. And, you know, with that, you get all sorts of, you know, you get all sorts of opportunities. Um, you know, if you want a detective spot or to get promoted or other sorts of specialized units that are full-time units, like all those part-time things I was doing was cool. But it's like, you know, if you want a chance to do that full-time, you have a better chance by going to a bigger agency that has that. Um, I knew some people over there. I knew their call volume was higher and I kind of, I wanted to be busy. Um, and, you know, so I went over there, um, you know, they just bigger opportunities, ability to be busy. It's a great town. Very commercial. It's pretty commercialized compared to where I came from. There's a lot of things going on outside of what actually goes on with the people that live there. So there's just, uh, there's all sorts of things going on. And it just opened up a, and that's what makes it the bigger department with all the opportunities. Right. And when you say bigger department, how many, how many sworn? Um, sworn uh, patrol right now, I, or patrolmen without uh, just general non rank. I think we're at like 60. And, you know, you throw in people with rank, you're, we're pushing near 100. So, yeah, that's a good size. Um, one of the guys, Joey, who works over at Police Post Training, he he was at the LAPD, which obviously is, you know, fucking huge. Yeah. yeah. And then he ended up uh, he ended up going to a much smaller agency, um, and he enjoys it much better. So kind of that, kind of from what I've heard, you know, at least my experience as well, you know, that that kind of mid range agency, a hundred to five hundred plus uh, ish, is is a good range in the sense of. You know a lot of the people. There is still room for advancement. You're not going to be stuck in in kind of one spot. Um, that's good, man. You're a productive guy. You wanted to go to a place with higher call volume, with more opportunities to grow your career. Now, was there a training difference between your first agency and your second agency? Um, yeah, when I first there was there was a lot of there was a lot of stuff going on training in the budget. Um, people were able to be like, hey, I really like this trainer, and I want to I, this training. I want to be a firearms instructor. I want to do this. And, you know, you just fill out like paperwork and say why you want to go to this training and the way their budget was staffed for training um, was like really good. And uh, so like a lot of, a lot of people were going to all sorts of different trainings, um, you know, before the, at the former part was smaller. So you'd get like an email like, Hey, we have this, this training going on. Everyone sent an email and fighting to go to this. But then there's like, Hey, just fill out this form if you, you know, if it serves a legitimate purpose and we can get you trained and we can get you more experience to bring to the table, like, here you go, we'll send you. So there was, uh, there was definitely a lot more opportunities. 
That's great. And that is one benefit to that kind of that mid range department is, uh, Sometimes if it's too big, it gets lost. If it's too small, there's not enough budget for it, and you don't have enough manpower and all that stuff. But um, that's great, man. Do you feel as if you became a better police officer when you started receiving more training? Yeah, I'd say so. Um, you know, I mean, you just – you got more aspects to work with, more tools on the tool belt and everything like that. And they would do a lot of additional training on top of like your mandatory in service and everything like that. We'd be, we'd be working and they had a garage that we have a garage, um, in our station where we keep some of the cruisers, we clear the cruisers out and we'd be doing like training drills with sim rounds and stuff like that. Guys that are trainers that on, that are on the job would stay on shift and just grab one car at a time. Hey, come in. We're going to go do this. We're going to do that. And just like put you in situations and you can, you're doing more than like your regular, Hey, we're just going to go to the range and qual once a year. We're going to do this. It was, we had enough people working to just like do that and cover calls. and everything like that. So it definitely, it just develops you, um, you know, the more you can practice and then the more you can throw on your tool belt as far as going to trainings and then bring that knowledge in to everyone around you on your shift is just, it's phenomenal. So definitely. Been. Yeah. And it seems like your chief, at least from us talking, he seems to be a pretty progressive guy. He seems to be a cop's cop, which I yeah. would describe as, as the kind of chief you'd want. Um, so that's, I think that's, I think that's really good, man. I think you're at a good spot. I did watch a couple of the, uh, a couple of news clippings uh, recently about, about your incident, which we'll get into here in a second. But um, it just seemed like he was a very solid guy, your chief, which I think is, I think is huge. I mean, Every chief has their flaws, but for the most part, you know, they have a job to do and if they have your back and they, and they're progressive and they're open minded and they're willing to listen. So that's, uh, that's super good, man. Yeah. Um, definitely. Um, it, him being like that and the, in like his surrounding deputy chiefs, um, you know, the level of support they kind of give you and knowing and even like just before you even go through that, knowing that that's who you have up there having your back that makes you it makes you more confident in doing your job where you're like, you're not worried about like, Oh, well, if chief sees this or this or that, like I'm going to do this or like whatever, you know, it takes kind of like the paranoia we tend to have about, about like if we had, if you, if anywhere, if you have a bad boss and you have somebody that's looking over your shoulder and you're not comfortable with who you work for, you're not going to have a good quality of life at work. And he, I don't know, I'm, I'm assuming he knows that and that's why he does it that way. But like working and then going through my incident from start to finish, it was huge in being able to get through everything. Well, I don't know your chief. I don't know his background in law enforcement. I just know he's your chief. Um, yeah. But it it seems like he was a cop before he became a chief. And I think that's extremely important and plays a vital role in leadership because I'm sure, um, you know, you got to start somewhere. Right. So he had to start from the bottom. He didn't just become chief. Like, you know, he had to, he had to do some stuff back in the day. So regardless of what that is, you know, but you can just tell he cares about his guys and his girls. Uh, shout out to your chief, man. Solid dude. Yeah. Matt, I do want to um, kind of, you know, kind of dive into your incident a little bit. I guess I can preface it with uh, you sent us an email to our coach and uh, Kelly and she forwarded it to me and said, Hey, you might want to look at this. So I read it and then I immediately reached out to you um, kind of regarding that just cause I just want to talk to you, man. Um, such a incredible outcome. I just really want to get your story out there, man. Cause I think that more people can, can learn from that and value what you have to say. And so I'm going to let you take the floor brother about uh, kind of how it started, what the call was and all that stuff. And you go from there. Yeah, definitely. And before I get into that, I just want to thank you again, like and Kelly as well, you know, uh, for everyone listening, like the email was kind of just, it was after the incident and I was like looking to get back in. I was doing the effective fitness training before and I was looking to get back into it, but I obviously had one arm I couldn't use. Uh, so, you know, I, I reached out to Kelly and just said, you know, Hey, what can, what can I do as far as workouts? How can I tweak these workouts and stay on the program while I'm out, you know, to kind of help me get through this and kudos to her because she reached out. She was spot on, helped me through that and being able to go to the gym and just like get out of the house and keep some, some semblance of routine 
uh, was just was huge. So, uh, yeah. you know, I, if I didn't kind of have that support there and that ability to talk to her and you guys about that, it was just like, it was huge. The Be Effective podcast is brought to you by our official uniform sponsor, Flying Cross. Fitness and combatives training are important for any success of any mission. But if your uniform is not functional, it will impact your ability to perform. Flying Cross is a uniform brand that offers comfortable and functional duty apparel and gear designed and tested by some of the most active and respected law enforcement agencies in the nation. They are built with the innovation and technology you need for high performance. Visit flyingcross.com forward slash EFT and use code EFT20 to receive 20% off any Flying Cross or Vertex products. Kelly's the shit, bro. Kelly's yeah. a fucking, she's the fucking rock. Around, uh, yeah. A lot of people don't know who Kelly is, but Kelly is our head strength conditioning coach at Effective Fitness. And before you say, oh, she's a chick, she can deadlift like 400 pounds. So yeah. just, just, just to be clear, she's super knowledgeable and she actually cares. Uh, she owned a gym specifically for first responders before she came to Effective Fitness full time. Sure. Um, and so she, she, she knows the profession. She's been in the, in the game a long, long time. Um, and so, uh, take it away, brother. Let's hear your story, man. It's incredible. Yeah. So, uh, I guess it'll start, um, you know, June, June 4th, uh, 2021. Uh, it was a Friday. Um, I was, just, I was working my shift assigned to day shift patrol. Usually I, I roll as a spare cruiser or somebody out. Uh, there's a two people out, myself and another officer with spares. So, you know, we fell into the sectors of the people that were out. Um, and, you know, going through the day, um, our shift is 6.30 to 2.30, kind of unique for a day shift compared to other law enforcement. But now you're standard 8 to 4, 7 to 3, but, well, it works. So it was, you know, the day shift, it was half over at that point. You kind of see the goal line towards the end. Um, I was actually... I'll throw this in there because it kind of goes to show you like how wild our job is, how you're like at one incident and then you're at a completely other incident. I was at a mental health call. Um, guy was just having issues, wasn't feeling heard by his family as far as like his concerns. So he took a ride on lawnmower and he decided to do straight up just circles around this five way intersection. Um, and just, to get the police to get there to talk to him because he wanted help. So here I am like talking to this guy, getting him to the hospital, working with clinicians to try to get him whatever help he needs. And just having this conversation, listening to him, hearing his frustrations. And he, he got what he wanted. He got police attention. And we, we have a certain unit that does follow-ups for mental health. So they got involved too. They got a clinician and stuff like that. So I was, I cleared that and I was on my way. I was actually in the report room. I'm about to type my report on that. And a uh, call came in um, outside of my sector, like pretty decently outside of my sector, but close to the station uh, for a domestic. So they send, they send two officers and a supervisor. I was, you know, I kept my radio on. We had, I was the only one tied up on a report. So I was like, they're good. We got enough coverage. Um, and then it came in that he took, the suspect took off. And after the officers got there and interviewed the victim, they got report that he took off. Not only did he take off, but uh, he had at least one firearm with her and with him, and threatened the victim with it. Um, so we're like, "Whoa!" So where this apartment complex was, literally just up a hill, is a middle school for a public middle school. Down the street is like an elementary school and a daycare, and it's like the commuter rails there. It's a busy area. So a bunch of people, you know, we started, everyone was all hands on deck at this time. We started doing a lockdown perimeter. We had people working details that had, you know, extra people with them. So they were able to kind of bounce off of the detail and leave, leave one guy to do it or people at contractors actually like got off the road for a little bit. So we, we got it down. Detectives are showing up. They're reviewing security footage inside the, uh, inside the, complex they actually just recently upgraded their security footage um to cover the whole complex they called in the off duty our canine handler we have one that does patrol and he was off duty so he was coming in because they're like hey he took off we might need a track so he's like all right fine he's coming in off duty so he gets there and 
they're trying to figure out with the cameras where where he ran off to. And meanwhile, we're checking apartments of people he's friends with, and you know, um, just checking all sorts of businesses in the area to see if he got out of the perimeter before we got there. Side streets, everything like that. That's what I was doing. I was kind of roaming. I checked the commuter rail, some businesses, checked around. And I actually went to one of the apartments that got called out. And um, after after I went to that apartment, we you know checked that apartment. The people were actually really cool. They were like, check in. He's not here. We'll let him know if he's here. And they let us literally walk through the whole apartment when he didn't have to, uh, which is unique nowadays. Um, our canine officer and his handler or, and his dog, Kit, were – they were on scene and uh, he was with another officer that was working day shift that was assigned as that was assigned to the call as the backup officer. Um, who's also he's officer cyber. He's a, he's a canine officer himself, but he has a drug dog. So the dog was inside. The, he was in, of use uh, for this track. So they're kind of hanging out, trying to wait, figure out where they're going to start the track and cleared that. I cleared that apartment, getting back into doing perimeter stuff. And, uh, Detective Sergeant gets on the radio. He's like, hey, we got him going in the wood line behind the building. So now the two officers, the two canine officers, one with his patrol dog, the other one just by himself, Officer Cushing and Seibert and canine Kit, they're all, they're ready to go. And they looked into it and the wood line is not like, it was thick. It wasn't really, it was like, it was, it was thick. Like you couldn't walk through it easy. Um, so they're like, hey, can we get a third? And I was right there. So I was like, yep, I'll be right there. Hopped in on the track. You know, we're going about, as we start going, I've been on a few tracks to know, especially with the kit, to know when he's, when he's hitting and when he's not, like, let alone any dog. And we knew he was hitting. And we were going through this thick, you know, like, almost like a, like a stack, you know, Billy, Officer Cushing, and Kit were in front, staggered to the right, it was, Dickie, Officer Cyber, um, he was off to the right a little bit behind Billy. And then I was off to the right behind Dickie a little bit. And we were walking not too tight, but tight enough um, that, you know, we could stay together. I was kind of just checking rear security side to side in case the guy doubled back, you know. And after about 100 yards, I'm doing a check in the rear and pulling my, turning my head to go back. And this is just how quickly this happens is, uh, you know, Kit alerted and, uh, you know, we gave, you know, Billy gave commands to drop the gun and, you know, before he could even, you know, before, before we even knew it, we were just, uh, we were under fire. Like by that, by the time my head went from looking behind me, hearing those commands to go forward, rounds were coming at us and we kind of fanned out a little bit. So like, and got on a line and, um, and started returning fire. Kit got hit, Kit got shot about three times. We were probably about 15 feet away from this guy. He was, before I get into that, we were about, looking back on we were about 15 feet away from him. And the reason why we got that close um, was he was behind cover and concealment. He had a rock and, like, was behind, like, a small tree um, sort of thing. So he had the cover and concealment, like, just, just straight up ambush position. So now, now we're on the fire. Um, you know, Kit's going, going in to get him, and uh, he hits Kit two or three times. Um, and Kit's down. You know, we're we're returning fire. And we're getting fired back at us. And then, as as we're, I'll do from my perspective first. As we're shooting, I'm there. I'm standing. I got my. I'm doing. I'm using my 45 pistol. Dickie had a had our like M4 version. Um, neck, he was next to me, and then Billy was next to him. As I'm shooting, I'm like, you know, I'm in the stance that your world, you know, muscle memory kicked in, and I just feel something in my arm. And I just feel like it was almost like somebody took was standing in front of me and like cocked their arm back as hard as they could and just did like a forearm shiver, like right to right to me to try to like knock me back. I kind of went back. I didn't. Didn't knock me off my feet, and at that point, I'm like, what the fuck? I've just been shot. I'm like, is this fucking really happening right now? Um, you know, continued to shoot my rounds. Um, 
and we have 10 in the chamber with a 45. I had to do a mag change. So I was hitting my left arm. I'm a righty. I shoot righty. My, so all my, we, I have an external carrier with all my shit on it. And, uh, so I'm like, fuck. So I dropped down to a knee, you know, let no loading. I'm looking I'm in the corner of my eye. I see Dickie just standing there. He's still shooting. He's providing cover fire. I'm doing I'm now with my, with my arm that's shot. I have to do a mag change. So I do that. And I go to put the mag in the pistol. And just like you do at the range, you always do it hard enough where the slide, when it's locked back, it always kind of goes forward. Now, didn't do that one for me. So now I'm reaching with, with my left arm and just racking it back. And then I got back into it, fired another round. Um, and then that's when there was a lull. And then, you know, myself and Dickie, we advanced on his position giving commands, um, suspect was down. Um, I could see Kit, Kit was down. He was, he's, he, we, you know, when I looked at him, I, I knew like he was gone. He was, a, you know, he's, he's a beast. Kit's a beast. Like the backstory on Billy and Kit is, he is just like well known throughout the state. It's just an absolute, those, that, like that duo is just insane. And the stuff that he's done as, as a canine and, and Billy's done as a handler is just like lights out. And I'm like, so I'm standing over this guy providing cover and I look out of the corner of my eye, Billy's down. I don't know. I don't know if he's dead. I don't know what's going on with Billy Dickey. Dickey's backstory is before he, he's been in, he's in his forties before he was in the, before he became a cop, he's an army combat medic. Like, perfect guy to have in that situation. Right. He goes over there, he sees Billy bleeding and immediately looks at the blood and is like, that's an arterial bleed. Luckily, our department gives us tourniquets. I had two tourniquets on me. I had one on my vest, one on my duty belt. I just, that's how I'd always roll. And that, I never did that until I came to Braintree. I never had tourniquets. Um, and he takes a tourniquet. He, you know, or Dickie starts working on Billy tourniquet and everything like that, checking him for any other wounds and everything like that. Um, I'm standing there providing cover and then, then Dickie comes over to me, starts working on me, you know, puts a tourniquet on me, tightens that up. And then, uh, you know, would ask me for another tourniquet. He's going to put it on to use to muzzle kit. And, uh, you know, we, at that point we all realized that there's nothing we could do for kit. So he went back to working on Billy and he went over the radio to give him an update of like what was going on. Um, at one point I jumped on the radio too. Um, but Dickie was giving his commands over the radio and we had people, like I said, we had a bunch of people doing perimeter that are all like on the outside of the perimeter being like, fuck, fuck this gunfire going crazy. We're a hundred yards in the woods. Like it's not like we could be like, Hey, we're on the one side of building number 50, you know? So we can't get on the radio and describe where we are in this woods. There's like a, like maybe a 12 foot wide river, not sometimes deep, not too deep. It's not really like a river river. It's more like a expanded Creek, uh, but it does get deep. And then there's like train tracks on the other side and then residential. Um, so people are like coming at us from behind us all over. And we're just, you know, they're like just yelling. At us. So I'm screaming. I'm like, we're over here. We're over here. Just yelling, yelling. I'm seeing people coming through this Creek to come over here. And I'm still covering the suspect because I can't do, I can't even help myself at this point. Um, they get in and then they start, they, you know, suspects in custody, they start working on him. And well, there's people got there before that and we're working on Billy. Um, we already had an ambulance in the area because of the domestic. She had some, some wounds. So we kind of, the sergeant made a call. I think it was the sergeant made a call to just say, like, Hey, have an, have an ambulance come. So there's already one standing by there. So they were up in the apartment. They come bolting down in the ambulance, running through the woods to our voices, and they get in a bunch of people. They get Billy loaded up. People are coming and help me. Uh, finally, once people got there and put him in cuffs, the suspect in cuffs, I finally like put my gun away and just took a breath, breather. And uh, they loaded Billy up, and then they're like, "Can you walk?" And I was like, "Yeah, I can walk." So I walked behind everyone carrying Billy and then people were kind of holding, they're keeping direct pressure on my gunshot wound. My arm was still, the tourniquet helped, but I had the exit wound in my back that was bleeding out. So that's blood is now coming out of that. And you can't, 
can't do anything but direct pressure. That's so they're helping me do that and like walk through the train. And, like, you know, you know, start to feel faint, blood rushing, but I made it to. Then they called for a second ambulance. That whole time, I'm like, fuck, like thinking about my wife, like letting her know she's probably freaking out. Uh, I'm worried about Billy. Thinking about Kit. You know, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm not worried about myself. Uh, you know, like at all at that point. Uh, and I'm thinking about it. like I'm seeing guys' faces as they're like running and helping me and Billy and seeing like I'm not looking at what my face looks like. I can't, but I'm looking at their faces and dudes I work with that are like tough as nails, just being like like fucking there's like white, there's just panic on their face. They're like, whoa. And I'm just like worrying about those guys. Like I hope they're all right. You know, like I actually reached out to one of them and I saw that I was like, Are you good, dude? You look you look pretty bad when you drove by me to escort the so when I was walking out to escort Billy's ambulance, I was like, I'm good now, bro. Um, and I was kind of like, I was just freaking out because I didn't, I, I didn't, I couldn't get an update on Billy until, you know, until they got me out of the trauma room. And um, one of the, one of my guys like stayed with me in the ambulance and like helped out with an extra set of hands in there. And it was, it was wild. Thank you for sharing that, Matt. Yeah. Um, that's a, uh... One of those, uh, holy fuck <laughs> situations, yeah. you know, um, yeah. being in a wooded environment, being ambushed, being shot, being able to return fire and having to assess after apply medical aid, uh, whether it's self aid or, or buddy aid, uh, and then being able to safely evacuate the hundred yard trek into the woods. You know, obviously you guys were up against someone who you said had cover and concealment. You guys were basically kind of following a track. Um, there are a couple of things that really stood out to me, man. Um, you know, besides you guys being super squared away, um, noticing when Kit was on, uh, on ascent, uh, or, or kind of was able to pick up on that. That's huge, man. That's, that's your ability to recognize, uh, change in canine behavior that he's he's within proximity to to the scent he had been tracking is uh is huge. Do you feel as if that kind of maybe allowed you guys to kind of be more ready for you're not really ever ready for ambush, but do you feel like it it definitely helped kind of bring alertness to to kind of what was going on at that particular time? I think so. I think it's I think it kind of kicked in a natural instinct in us. I mean I mean, I'm working with two canine guys and that have way more time on the job than me. Um, and I'm thinking, I mean, I know, I know they, they're thinking that, but like in my head, I'm like, okay, like I've been on as many tracks as them or experience in canine, but I'm like, okay, I know like we got, we got somebody that's hiding in the woods. Like this track is legit. This isn't going to be like one of the tracks that sometimes you, you more often than not you're on where you're like, all right, the dog's kind of hitting here, but then he's going there, but then he's going back here. So you kind of, your instincts, you're not like, your like hypervigilance really like hasn't kicked in or your like your spider sense or whatever, you know, you want to call it. But like when, yeah, when he started, when he's, when he was sniffing and he was like going straight and like just getting after it, like how somebody would run. Like if I ran into the woods and like was going to like go somewhere, that's how it would happen. Like you you're not like zigzagging all over the place. Like you're beeline in it somewhere. And like, I'm like, okay, he's, he's following something. This is, this is legit. So yeah. Did you guys use some type of actor, you know, some type of like after action or was there some type of review? I mean, you know, obviously the evidence collection and, and, and in the case and stuff like that, but did your agency do any type of like debrief with its officers kind of after everything was, was kind of cleared? Yeah. Yeah, they did. Um, so I think I want to say that night or maybe the next night, um, I'm like, I can't be entirely sure, but they had debriefs and for all the officers involved. So we're part of like a regional SWAT team, but they also have, they're not just SWAT. They have all sorts of stuff. They have, um, you know, critical incident stress management team, a SISM team. So that team would go out and like respond to these things. I mean, Ideally, even something's lesser than a critical incident, like, hey, you went to a really shitty call, like, we're going to do a debrief. So they, like, run the debrief, they'll, sometimes they'll bring a clinician in and they'll just, like, 
hey, let's do debrief, let's do an after action, you know, thick skin, let's get it all out there, let's talk about it, what could we have done, what couldn't we have done, what's bothering you from it, and everything like that. So that was done with those guys, and then at a pretty later date, it was done, it was done with me, Billy, and Dickie, um, you know, because uh, I, I, I was in the hospital until the next day, Billy, Billy was in the hospital um, for a while longer. Is Billy okay? Is he is he good to go? I mean, relatively speaking, I mean he's uh, he just had another surgery last week, so he's he's recovered from that. So okay, good. To go back on the incident, so like I kind of only talked, like I went through the incident, so I didn't like to looking back on how everything is like when I didn't know what, how Billy was. When it turns out, um, like I got shot the one time, it went above my elbow, up my arm out my back um just kind of think of like you know like you look at the wounds it's a really weird thing but if you if you put your arms out like you're shooting a pistol and you look at where it is in the mirror like you can see the direct line how it traveled that makes sense but with billy so billy got shot five times three three in the vest two in his left um like forearm elbow area so he's had He's like the surgery that he just had. I don't even, I, I, I'd have to ask him like, Hey man, how many have you had? Um, cause they'll go in, they'll fix one thing. Or like at one point they did the bone that shattered, they replaced with cement and screws and then they let that sit and then they opened it back up and then did a bone graft and replaced that. So now he's kind of, he's working on like muscle and tendon recovery right now. So he's, yeah, he's, he's got, he's still got a road ahead of him. Absolute fucking warrior, man. Absolute savage. Um, what firearm was the suspect shooting? Uh, he had a forty caliber. Yeah. He had a feed forty caliber. So kind of looking at some of the after action, what were some of the takeaways that kind of were said in the debrief with you guys? They'd ask like when we uh when we kind of got out of there, like one thing there, when did you notice yourself thinking outside of police situational to like a human level that like the average person level of like what's going on? Like when did you break that like police mode, I guess, stuff like that. Um, I mean, for me, that was when I was like, I mean, I guess early on was when I, when I saw that, you know, Kit was gone. And then also when I was just kind of like worried about, everybody else just like in the ambulance just like thinking about everybody like that and like my wife's gonna shit like what the fuck and like uh all this stuff like just kind of thinking about that aspect like and all everybody that was there and just it's like i know like we had a lot of solid people get a lot of hands on and do a lot of stuff and i still think about it today like i i just like i wish i could write like a big thank you card to the whole department all these surrounding departments because there's a lot of a lot of hands-on stuff they did. And then the, the canine community for the team, like they were all there. Like they took like to take care of Kit and because like Billy wasn't able to see Kit for almost a couple of weeks until, cause he was in the hospital until afterwards and like stuff like that. So it was wild. It, it's as far as the DB go, they asked about that and just kind of discuss things that we would do different and, you know, anything like that. And, when, you, when I still look back on it, I don't think there's much you could do differently. You have you have somebody armed in the woods. We didn't have any we didn't have any like suicide by cop statements, knowing like, hey, he's going to try this, or um, like criminal history wasn't a proven indicator like of violence. So we weren't like, all right, the threat assessment didn't bring us to a level where like maybe you shouldn't go in there. Like when I say Kit and Billy are rock stars in the in the community for canine around here and all the whole state like billy's gone after some armed dudes previously armed and currently armed with kit over the course of their 12 years together and just this doesn't happen you know what i mean so it's like right. if you if you say like oh there's a firearm involved i'm not going to go like the what, what the only other option, like people ask me, like, what else could you have done? I was like, I guess you could have called like the state police and have them put up their air wing. But then, 
okay, they pinpoint the guy. You're still going to have to like, what are you going to do? Shout commands from a helicopter? Like you're still going to have to get within range on somebody where they can use their firearms. So, and the threat assessment wasn't there to call in a helicopter that's supposed to be like covering the whole state to be like, hey, can you come do this? And it was like a hot day, thick brush. So even thermals might not work and let alone just like your regular cameras to see this person in a concealed position. So we talked about, you know, what we could have done different and what we would have done different. And it was like, we were kind of solid and there really weren't, there really weren't other options that were really on the table. Right. And I have some experience with that, with, uh, with like the handheld FLIR for patrol. And you're right. Uh, even with like a heavy canopy, the helicopter would not been able to do, uh, as much as people think it would have been able to do. I feel like absolutely incredible, man. Um, is there, is there a reason? And I can, I can see it's slowly being phased out because because there's an agency here that that you guys carry Glock twenty ones. Uh, and we don't have Glocks. We get uh six hours. Six hours. But you guys carry the forty five. Right? Yeah, yeah. For now, we're actually transitioning to nine mils. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. Yeah. Um, because man, ten rounds is is not that many when you can have seventeen. You know, um, yeah. that's a that's literally almost double. And so what that does, obviously you know exactly what that does. That's, that's great. You guys are transitioning to the nine millimeter. Um, I wish more agencies would take that approach. Um, I think the reason why they don't is probably because of money. I mean, you have to buy all new guns, new ammo, new holsters. All, yeah, all it, was, it was a lot. We had to tap into like some funds outside of the budget to try to like get it done. And- yeah. So, um, Matt, I do want to talk about, uh, a little bit more into the incident seemed like a very, obviously a very dynamic situation. Um, extremely dynamic. I mean, how many cops go, yeah, man, let's go train some wooded force on force situations. Like yeah. it just, it just doesn't happen. Right. Like unless you're specifically training for that specific type of thing. So that just kind of, you know, that just goes to show you, just like you said, the adaptation that you guys had to overcome to win the encounter. Yeah. And that's, I think it's extremely incredible. And I think that speaks volumes to the level of training you three had, uh, and canine kit. Um, because man, that's, that's, uh, not an ideal environment, not an ideal situation. You guys still came out on top. So again, I, that speaks absolute volumes to your level of, uh, level of preparedness. Um, do you feel as if all of your prior training that you've had, and the training that you've done outside of your agency prepared you for that day? I think so. Um, I think a lot too. Like I even, it's crazy because shoot, I haven't been, it's been probably seven years since I was, you know, in the guard, in the infantry. And we would do like weekend trainings where we do like all sorts of like field training exercises in like the woods of these like random bases and stuff like that. And, like it did actually like it kind of felt like I was going through like one of those trainings again. There was some muscle memory that even kicked in from that far back. Like, you know, like knowing to um turn around, look behind me and kind of do stuff like that. Like that's all stuff that I mean, I've been trained on as a police officer, but that's all like muscle memory that I had from like being from being in the military. Um and then it's just kind of, you, you build, I've built on that being a police officer and it's, it's definitely, it definitely helped us out huge that day. Just being able to go in there, the training and experience that we had, um, and going through these like extra trainings where we do sim rounds and we're like, all right, yeah, you're getting shot at or You're like moving from this one and you're going to do this and you're doing a lot of scenario based. Um, getting away from that whole like, all right, well, the minimum standard is like we have to qualify with our weapon system once a year and all this stuff and go through the annual in-service. So by being able to do that extra stuff, it definitely helped. You know, it gets you in that mindset. And with that, I don't know if it's by design that they do it, but by the fact that they're pulling you off of like a lot of times they're like not saying, hey, come in on overtime, get ready and we'll go through the scenarios. Uh, no, hey, you're working. We're going to set up the scenario. And we're going to call you in whenever it's your turn, and just like come in, 
go through the scenarios. All right, good. You're good to go. Go back out, lead the patrol, do your thing, respond to calls and everything like that. Cause that's how it happened. Like I went from a mental health call about to start typing a report to, Hey, this is going on. We need hands on deck. And then now I'm part of the track and everything like that. And, you know, same thing with, you know, Billy, if Billy was at home doing his own thing. And next thing you know, he's like, Hey, come in, you're doing this. I mean, he's obviously used to that. He's been doing that for years, for over a decade. And then, you know, Dickie's, Dickie was there with me on that mental health report. You know, he just didn't have to write the, the mental health, he didn't have to write the report. And next thing you know, he's called in to be this backup officer on domestic and he's, he's on the track. And it's just, that's, that was a good way to do it. Like, cause you, you're never going to get like a phone call being like, Hey, um, uh, you're about to go to a call where you're going to encounter a guy with guns. Make sure you grab everything you need. It's going to start at 10 o'clock. Go. That's a really good point. And that just goes to show that even that additional training that is beyond what your agency requires for you to be a, you know, be a police officer, you guys doing that force on force training, that scenario based training, you know, did it play a role in the outcome? We can never actually quantify that with data, but we can, it didn't fucking hurt. Yeah. Right. Like it didn't, it didn't hurt. And we, we know you guys got more reps. You guys got more, uh, more exposure, more experience in training, which then obviously directly correlated to, to the outcome of your situation. And I think that's, I, I think that speaks volumes. And that just goes to show you that if you rely on the minimum standard, I don't even want to think about what the outcome could have been if you guys were just like, oh, we're just in-service guys. You yeah. Know, we're just we're just going to sh- stand on the line and shoot our 50 rounds and then go home. What's incredible is that you're not the first person to tell me that. Like guys that who, guys who have been in officer-involved shootings or even multiple officer-involved shootings have said, uh, you know, after my first shooting, I realized how prepared I was not uh, for that situation. And it, you know, either I got lucky or, or, you know, maybe I was just good that day. Um, but the fact that you guys are putting in the work consistently, you know, obviously directly contributed to, to the outcome. I mean, I think that's, uh, I think it's, uh, for anybody listening it's proof right there, get your ass training. You know what I mean? Train at that, train at that higher level, you know, when it comes to that, that level of being able to, even after being shot, um, cause I can see what you mean. You know, if you're, if you're kind of punching out in that round pie, like pie, like entered somewhere around your bicep and then came out your back, correct? Um, the outside of the arm. So it, oh, came, it came out the outside of the arm. It yeah. Came in the, it came in the outside. Yeah. But yeah. You did that. So and you're up like that. It just goes up and it came off my back. It like ricocheted off a bone obviously and like hit some stuff, but yeah, it came up and, and to tell you the truth, like I, I thought I, I had no clue how it actually worked. Like, it's not like CSI when you go to the hospital. They're like, hey, it went like this and this. And they're like sticking this like tube in you to show you the direction of the bullet or whatever. It, it, I couldn't even, I couldn't lift that arm after, obviously, for a really long time. And the wounds were healing. And then after they healed and the bone healed where I could actually lift that arm up without being in an immense amount of pain, did I like one day just like look in the mirror and be like, Oh, I just assumed it ricocheted down and that's why it did it. It's like, no, that was like, that was like a straight up path. And it didn't make it more so just like, instead of doing a ricochet out, it actually just like blew through a portion of the bone and went out. It was, it all, it all kind of, it lines up. Like I had that arm punched out and, and it's just, yeah, it was, it, it, was, yeah. it was wild when I was able to like one day just look at that and I was like, wow. And you're pretty, you know, and, you know, obviously people can't see you, uh, like I can, you're a pretty fit dude, right? Like you're, you look strong. You're built like a tank. Do you feel as if not even, I'm not even talking about the incident. I'm talking about purely from the recovery standpoint. Do you feel like your ability to recover has been, um, I don't want to say quicker, but has been, I guess, more progressive because you are in better shape? I mean, I mean, you know, there's always there's always room for improvement on the shit. On being <laughs> right, <shape>. right. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. Um, of course, of course. I mean, I didn't really think too much about it until just back in December. I had a surgery um, after they did an MRI and they found after I was recovering after about six months of recovery, like, uh, three months of recovery, 
they were I got an MRI to like look in because PT wasn't really going great. It was I was there I was hitting a roadblock and uh so I never really thought like because it was bone damage I'm like I'll get it back and I, at first I was like pissed off I was like why isn't this working um, and my recovery wasn't great um, I was at this roadblock and then they did the MRI and my, my orthopedic surgeon was like yeah so read the MRI and your delta got torn off the bone and it's been shrinking away down toward your like elbow They're like that's why you're having these issues I'm like all right so they went in in December. And drilled into my bone um, so they could pull the deltoid up and then su- put sutures through the bone to reattach it and make everything good in there. And uh, they, you know, they cleaned up some of the canals that were made from the bullet and stuff like that. And uh, that sucked. That was just, you know, at first, like the first few weeks would suck. But uh, once I started getting into PT, like I was expecting that happened in December, I wasn't expecting to really recover the expectation between me and my surgeon was like six months. Um, I, spoiler alert, I'm back at work this week. Um, Fuck so, yeah, dude. Fuck so yeah. three, so three months early. Um, and I think it was just like, even doing PT we were, we started to transition to a lot of strength base and exercises at PT and, um, like physical therapist, she was like, Oh, we're going to do this. Do you know this exercise? I was like, yeah, I like this exercise. Let's do it. This and that, and we, I was like, kind of like getting back into stuff that I was doing before the shooting, and it's like, it's like, it just like it was like falling, up, it was like, you know, falling off a bike. I just got back on, and I feel like since my body was used to that and doing that and putting myself through that, I do feel like it definitely, um, it definitely made the recovery process better. Hundred yeah. percent, dude. That is, first off, I'm not surprised that you are three months early, just because. Talking to you the first time, your mindset was just like, dude, I'm ready to get the fuck back. Like, I'm just ready. And and that drive, I, I just, just remember you telling me that. You're like, I'm, I'm going fucking crazy. <laughs> um, you know, man, but that but that drive and all the work you put in prior to your incident, 100% contributed to how fast you recovered. 100%. That is backed by science. That's backed by research. Um, I did a podcast with um, the guys from Odin Medical. Carl's his name. He's a, uh, he was a veteran. Uh, yeah, actually I think he's still in the garden. Uh, he was blown up a few times by IED. Uh, now he's a SWAT medic, uh, or a SWAT doc, excuse me, in Tulsa. Okay. And, um, he kind of talks about kind of being blown up. Uh, and he talks about when he was in medical school about how he did, a, a basically a research on people who are in shape or in some type of shape. Uh, and they, sustain some type of catastrophic injury like a gunshot wound and their recovery rate on that or um or the mortality rate on that right and basically what it showed was if you're in better shape uh you're less one less likely to die from a gunshot wound straight up um and if you are in better shape your likelihood of recovery is going to be much faster than if you were not in shape previous to that injury um and to me like sometimes you probably let me guess you were the guy in physical therapy where they were doing stuff and you were like, all right, I can do more than this. Like, this is like, let me, let me kind of loose. Cause I, I feel like you're the kind of guy. Cause I, I know guys like this as well. that are just, they're, they're physical therapy and you're like, man, well, I've been doing this at home and you're telling me now just to do this. So I feel like I can kind of push that boundary. Do you feel as if you were kind of always pushing that edge on recovery to trying to get better faster? Um, yeah, I wanted to, um, but when I first started going to PT before they found out that I had the deltoid, was just like not there. Um, that was the frustrating part because I wanted that mindset and I kept trying to push and I was like, I can't. And the, the, the hardest part too was like, I still was like, I still couldn't like, I, I had two, two boys, um, you know, five and three and I couldn't. I couldn't like, I couldn't hold my three-year-old like in that arm. I had to always do that. And for the longest time it was daddy has a good arm. Daddy has a bad arm. Um, you know, trying to keep it simple for them. So I was wicked frustrated. Um, then I had the surgery and then I've been bouncing back and like, that's where I am now. Like I, I'm definitely, I'm pushing it. And like part of the PT is like, they giving me, she's giving me some work and, like an app similar to like the train heroic app um, of like, Hey, these are the workouts. This is what I want you to do. Um, 
And when we are there, like when I'm actually at physical therapy, we're doing it. She's like, all right, so how's this? How's that? And I was like, let's go up and wait. She's like, all right, uh, add 10 pounds. Like if we're doing dumbbell stuff, and I'm like, yeah, 10 pounds each side. She's like, no, I mean 10 pounds total. I'm like, no, let's do 10 pounds each side. And Hell so, yeah. I love it, bro. I love it. That's, that's awesome, dude. Keep that attitude, man. And, and, and two, um, I mean, you got kids. That's, whew, that's a motivator right there, man. That's a fucking, that is, that is the why for a lot of people. I know yeah. it's my why, you know, um, I do kind of want to touch on that a little bit real fast. Cause you know, you went through a, 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 a critical incident and I'm sure your wife, and you kind of referenced her a few times, like my wife's going to kill me. Um, you know, she, uh, uh, how's she doing? Is she doing okay now? I mean, I know probably at the time she was probably, I can't even imagine her emotions. Um, but you know, it seems you have a really good support system, but is she doing okay now? Yeah, she's, she's a rock star. She's great. Um, I mean, shit, uh, she was, she was even keeping me on my toes like day one and two in the hospital. Like, um, it's funny, like something, this popped in my head when you asked me like, Oh, what, uh, what gun did the suspect have? And I was like 40 cal. And, uh, it was funny too. Cause I didn't ask my own deputy chief and chief that question until like the next day when I was like waiting for the discharge and they were kind of like, it was discharged in the afternoon. I was like, we can get out of there. I'm hanging out in the bed. I was like, Hey, what did he have? And she's sitting right there. She goes, probably a BB gun. I'm like, Ooh, all right. Right. I'm, she's keeping me right on my toes. there, throwing. And she's not treating me any different than any zingers or anything like that. But she's, uh, she's a rock star. We were together when I was in Afghanistan, you know, we, boyfriend girlfriend so she kind of and she was going to school she was in her like senior year of nursing school trying to graduate doing that while like dealing with me being in Afghanistan so she's been a rock star from that and just like she's been through that and now I'm putting her through it with this um but she's solid she's like when I told her I wanted to go back and that's what I was looking to do you know kind of looked at options and whether or not and I wanted to, you know, see if this is what I want to continue. She was, she was like, I, she's like, I know you're going to, she's like, I have confidence in your ability, just like she did when I went to Afghanistan. She's like, I have confidence in your ability to do what you need to do and not be stupid about it. And I was like, oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and she's, and then she's kind of said the same, it's similar to like when I told her I want to go back to police and she's just like, to, and do the same thing I was doing before. She's like, you know what? I know, I know that's what you want. She's like, I know if you go and just, you know, take a retirement or whatever, um, or push for retirement and, you know, everybody's different. So like anybody out there that's been through something like that, that went through retirement, like by all means, like, everybody's perspective is unique. Even the three of us, like our critical incident, like we all have different perspectives. So, um, that we went through with that shooting, even though we were all there in the thick of it. So like no shame on, on taking that. She said, she's like, I know you wouldn't be, I mean, I'm in my thirties. So like what I'm going to have to do another job. I'm not going to be a stay at home dad. She's like, I know you wouldn't be happy if you weren't doing something where you were helping people and excite and had that in no, like, like, you know, to be totally honest, had some level of excitement in it and stuff right. like that. Had some purpose behind it. Um, so she knew. She's just like, so I support you. you know? So the week back has been has been solid. You know? and, uh, she's definitely seen to the next level, like that thin blue line. Like when she, when she had to go see me in the hospital, I'm sure that there's a part, there's a, appreciation there but i think there's a part of her that looks at that and she's like sees the rallying of support that we had from like all over and it's just like i'm sure that probably helps her with knowing that i'm back at work and the true mission of law enforcement is bigger than just one person right it's everybody's like oh law enforcement when you when you hear those words you think enforcing the law correct yeah. so much more than that dude it really is it is, is, it is, it is a community. It is a blanket of protection, um, of the people of your community. You know, um, it takes a special person to wear a gun and badge to work. People who have never been a cop 
I never expect them to understand. I, I, I don't, I, I don't expect them um, to understand what it's like in this profession. Um, for you wanting to go back, dude, I absolutely salute you hundred percent, man. That is, uh, you know, hundred percent support it. I would hundred percent support anything you did. Thank you. Yeah, man. That's, 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 that's huge. Um, you know, and if there's anything we can do for Billy as well, please let me know. We can talk offline more about that. Um, I want to make sure he's, he's comfortable and he's taken care of, uh, while he recovers. Um, being sh- I can't even imagine being shot five times. I can't imagine being shot once, bro. I can't fucking even, even fat. You're like, it's like when somebody just does, and I'm like, no, it's, it's, it's probably not like that. Like <laughs> it sounds a lot worse, but you know, man, you're, you guys are absolute units. Uh, and, and I do appreciate you reaching out truly. Yeah. You know, I would be lying to say, uh, you know, we don't get a lot of emails from, from people, uh, and I do my best to to really try to reach out to as many as possible. But when I got your message, um, I was like, I got to talk to this guy ASAP. Send me his email. Let's you know, let's hop on a Zoom call. And we've been staying in touch back and forth. Um, you know, I know I was slacking one time on one of your responses, but I know you were recovering. And and you know, I want to respect your time and your family. Uh, you're not on social media, so uh, I'm pretty proud of you for that one, man. That's uh, that's uh. That's uh, super impressive. And I know you don't have social media, but you do want to shout out some organizations that have helped you kind of recover and through your incident. So if you, if you would like to do that, please feel free to do that now. Um, so oh, people yeah. can, uh, if you want to whip open the phone there and go ahead, bro. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, well, they talked about was, um, you know, Dickie, us have, we had tourniquets. It's they're issued to us. Um, and if they're not, and if you want more, we can they'll get you more, um, at our department. It's part of like, our gear, um, which is great. But, um, you know, while I was out, you know, I was made aware of it's, it's actually started by a state trooper in Massachusetts, Mike Best, good dude. Um, he started the law enforcement, the LEO support foundation. Um, you know, while we were out, they teamed up with a shoot tournament. They like teamed up with a bunch of sponsors to do a shoot tournament up in New Hampshire. And, um, you know, we actually sent some groups out there to compete and it was like some, it was some high speed stuff. Unfortunately, I didn't make it out there to watch it. Um, but I got videos and it was cool. And part of that like fundraiser actually went to, um, you know, the three of us to help us while we were out. But I mean, not just what that was huge, what they did. And that's what brought me to know what they, their main purpose is, what they do is they do fundraise, other fundraiser stuff to like raise a general fund so that they can go out and buy tourniquets and outfit, full on outfit police departments with, um, with those tourniquets. And, you know, knowing how important that is, that was for us that day. And then just like there's other times where, you know, we go to calls and it's like you go to a medical and like something like that. You need a tourniquet for somebody else or whatever. Like I carry two, one for me and one for somebody else. It would be. Um, so I just want to give a huge shout out to them. Uh, LEO Support Foundation. Um, you can find them on Instagram um, at Save LEOs, L-E-O-S. Um, and their like, website is SaveLEOs.org. Great group right there, um, you know, s- solid what they're doing. And then there's another one. This one's kind of this one's starting to touch nationwide. It's called uh, Vipo, the Violently Injured Police Officers Organization. It was started by a detective in Somerville that's also just outside of Boston. He was shot pretty bad, and he tried to come back to work after being shot multiple times. Came back to work for a year and was like, this isn't good. But he was so young in his career. He wanted to, he couldn't retire. He couldn't do the job anymore. He wanted, he had to take a retirement, but the retirement that he had wasn't any good. I mean, like compared to like, so like it was just, he was going to have to retire and there really wasn't much else out there for him at the time to do. Um, so he figured out, he found out that you could actually, in Massachusetts, you could ask your city or town to, request at the state level a special retirement which is like it's a hundred percent retirement up until you're 65 and then it goes down to 80 which is like kind of what we do in our pension program for police officers um 
you know, it's similar to line of duty death benefit your family would get. Um, so he started doing that and then he started reaching out to other viable, and then they just started an organization where it's almost, it does support network work too for officers that are in critical incidences. And he's taken that retirement that he got and he's lobbying in Massachusetts to make that a law. So like, Hey, if you meet the criteria for a violently injured during a critical incident, like here's your retirement. He had to jump through hoops for like two years to get his mayor to sign off on it and all this stuff. He's at, in, he's introduced legislation in um, Oklahoma. I think he, in Oklahoma and Kentucky, he had it passed and he's, introduced the bill down in Florida and Arizona now. So he's, his goal, he's all over the place, started in mass. His goal is to have this law in every, in every state. So that like, there's, there's something out there that's a law that's going to take care of us when we, when we get in the shit and realize that, Hey, we can't come back to work. And we, Matt, before I forget, send me his contact info. I will. Um, absolutely. Cause I, cause I, cause I, I have some, I have some friends that that might be interested in that might can maybe help him um, specifically in Florida and other States. So um, yeah, yeah. I'd love to be able to just, you know, at least try to point him in the right direction. Cause I think what he's doing, I think that it's, it's, there's nothing more frustrating uh, than being hurt in the line of duty and then being like, we're going to give you a quarter for almost dying. Thank you <laughs> for your service. Yeah. And that Fucking was bullshit. So that's carry on. Sorry. No, 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 I agree hundred percent. Like I'll, I'll send you that stuff. He's, uh, yeah, he's been getting after that for a while. Like I actually, before the shooting, I've like had him speak and talk about his experience and go through that, like his critical incident kind of and like, and then everything that he's doing. So he's been fighting in Massachusetts for a while. It's, uh, it's kind of been a longer fight to try to get it statewide. Um, right now you can still like individually request that, but if you don't have the backing of your chief, and you're like mayor or town manager and like to go forward with it. And then it's just, it's not easy. So like some departments, some departments, it's easier. Some departments harder. So his, their websites, uh, VIPO 911.org uh, is, is if you ever want to look into it and, you know, they got all sorts of, they do like, like I said, they got support groups out there too for us. Like, so it's not just, pushing the retirement plan and everything like that. So those are, those are two groups that I've definitely interacted with recently that are doing some really great stuff between just helping you when you're on the job with the tourniquets and anything else you might need for support. And then, you know, after you've been in the shit, like let's, let's, let's make it so the law takes care of you, you know, which is, it's great that they have something if you die. So your family's all set, but if you survive and you can't, you can't physically or mentally go back to work, which is totally understandable. There should be something out there for you. That's not that you don't have to go hat in hand to your legislature to get to happen. It should just be, should be pretty automatic. And that's, that's what he's fighting for. You would think, yeah. you would think that it would be available. And there is this, that's, I've heard horror stories uh, of uh, one officer, in particular. I can't remember his name, but he was, uh, he was shot in the head and he wasn't able to, he basically had to medically retire and he's like, you know, I live in New Jersey and I'm only making like $45,000 a year. And in New Jersey, like that's, it's like almost poverty in New Jersey. And, and and he's like, I can't find another job. And so it's like, Oh, okay. So thank you for getting, you know, thank you for your service. Here's barely enough money to live. And then that's, that's it. Yeah. It's like all of that, everything he sacrificed, you know, almost his life. And now he's incapable of, of finding a, uh, a job. And that's the, it's frustrating. So yes, please get me in touch with your buddy. Um, I yeah. want to see what I can do to, to, to help him, um, multiply his voice, extend his voice out into these people. But, um, Matt, thank you so much for, for coming on and sharing your story, brother. Um, I know it's not easy to, to talk about it. Um, Anything we can do for Billy and Dickie, please let me know. Uh, let me know. Uh, canine kit, absolute unit. Uh, thank you for your service, brother. Um, Hero man wouldn't be wouldn't be here without him. So. Yeah, that's. Uh, and again, I think I think that canines are one of the most underutilized tools in law enforcement, and they are phenomenal 
phenomenal resource. Um, one of my best friends is a canine sergeant here. I actually, I'm, I'm particularly fond of police canines. I just love the way they work. I love hearing grown men cry. (laughs) 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 It's a, it's a different type of scream. Um, yes, 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 it is. Um, (laughs) and, and, uh, you know, if there's anything that we can do, um, I'm in touch with some canine organizations. I know you guys are, are probably getting a lot of offers, but, um, you know, again, if I can point you guys in the right direction, uh, maybe help out even more, I would love to do that. Um, I would love that. I appreciate that. Thank you very for your much. agency. And, uh, you know, stay safe, dude. Stay, uh, and you, you know, again, uh, get back on EFT, bro. We need you back on the squad. We need you getting, getting swole again. And, uh, we're going to hook your agency up as well. So Matt, thank you so much, man. Um, and we'll talk soon, brother. Thank you as well, man. Thank you very much. All right, buddy. Links to the organizations Matt has talked about are in the show notes below. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and leave a review. New episodes launch on Monday every other week. Don't forget to check out EFT, our performance-driven solutions for your training and fitness needs. 